All right, and recording has started. All right, yeah, so thank you all again for, for joining me today. Uh, I'm pretty excited about our markdown. As Katie said, it's probably my, uh, my favorite topic in, in R. Um, and today will be the magic of knitting, which is a play on words because R markdown uses the knit R package to actually knit to or create other outputs from the single R markdown document. Go over here. So today's agenda, we'll be covering uh, kind of the basics of R Markdown, just so you can see the difference between, say, you know, an R script or writing in the console, uh, different output formats, which for there's a lot, but for today I'll be focusing on presentations. So uh, Zeringen, which is actually what this presentation is written in, uh, PowerPoint, and uh, a couple other formats here. Let's see if I can get that. Uh, websites, including Bookdown and Distill. And then reports, which will be uh, parameterized reports, which is a way of creating uh, multiple reports from the same type of code, and flex dashboard, which is more for uh, kind of a, a dashboard written in uh, R Markdown. So this is some artwork from uh, one of the, the artists in residence at our studio and kind of uh, goes through the basic examples of what R Markdown is. You take text, code, and then you have an output, put it all together, put it through some magic pots and you end up with these beautiful reports or beautiful outputs. And while it's kind of a funny graph or kind of a fun thing to look at, like this is really what it is. It feels like magic sometimes, but in reality, it's just, this is the benefit of working with code as opposed to like building things manually. So as Mike mentioned, rather than saying potentially copy pasting into Word, you could actually generate a Word document from an R Markdown report. R Markdown itself uh, starts as a notebook style interface, which allows you to mix code with prose. Basically, you write uh, text, you write comments or things you're doing or, or reports about what you're doing, intermixed with and intermingled with code that's being evaluated by R. Um, you can then knit it to different uh, formats. So this includes HTML for web content, uh, PDF, handouts, books, reports, dashboards, uh, interactive, shiny applications, uh, articles, and even whole websites. Um, if you've heard of the blog down package, or you've heard about people blogging in R, a lot of people actually create their entire blogs uh, in R Markdown. And then for saying just a quick example of what this looks like, and I'll go into a live demo a little bit later, um, this is the most basic R markdown. So you have, uh, you know, your lines of code, like we saw before with an R script. Um, and then you have some text. So this text here won't be evaluated by R. It's just, you know, written about what you're doing. As opposed to things here inside these code chunks, is what we call them, which are uh, indicated by these three back ticks, your parentheses, and then R and then the ending back ticks. Basically anything inside here will be evaluated as normal R code. Then you can do some writing and then you have another chunk of R code. And in this example, it's actually generating uh, a, a graphical output. So it's actually building a graph for you. And the outputs themselves, you can have a basic HTML document. So this one is uh, HTML, so you can open it in a web browser. It's kind of boring, but just kind of the idea that you wrote some text, you wrote a little bit of code, so summary of the car's data set, and you generated a plot, and then uh, R took that and converted it into this web document without you having to write anything related to the web. Alternatively, you could always end up in a PDF, so maybe you're generating a port for a distribution or you want to share it amongst your team. You could also generate a Word doc or a PDF document. And I'll jump over to RStudio Cloud to give a quick live demo of what this different uh, kind of frameworks look like. So before we had primarily worked or I'd shown examples from R scripts, which uh, you can see this is indicated, let me make this a little bit bigger. It's indicated by uh, this .r format here. So this is all valid R code. You know, I can write it, it will evaluate it here in the console at the bottom. So I've assigned the value 3.14 to X. I can then say x times 10, and it gives me 31.4. However, I've got some text here that we call uncommented, where if we put a pound sign in front of it, it will comment it. And the comment means that it won't be evaluated by R. So I can do it and, and nothing happens. It actually skips to the next line. It goes all the way down to here. However, 
If I don't have it uncommented like this, you can see it's throwing an error because R is trying to evaluate this and it can't. It, this means nothing to it because this is not a valid function. So if I actually called that, it will give me an error because this doesn't exist. So I would need to comment this out if I were gonna write comments about what I was doing. I can go down further and you know uh, call repeat. I wanna repeat the Texas where I'm actually living right now four times. And we can see that it generates it four times. I can load a library and the glue library basically pastes uh, parts of text together where things inside these uh, brackets will be evaluated. So if X is uh, 3.14, I can say glue the value of pi is equal to X. If we call that out, it says the value of pi is now 3.14. And then I have a comment here, which is not evaluated because it has a pound sign in front of it. How many pies do I want? And I want X to be now X divided by 3.14 plus six. And I'll glue another thing saying, I want X number of pies. I want seven pies, I like pie. But just kind of going through in like this kind of silly example that uh, in R scripts, if you wanna write anything that's not code, you have to comment it out, which leaves you with this kind of format like you see here. If we switch to an R markdown document, which you can see is indicated here by dot RMD, and at the top, it has this header that says uh, output HTML document. This is an R markdown uh, kind of script, if you wanna think about it that way. And we can see that each of the code chunks now has back ticks in front of it. So three back ticks, our parentheses, and then we say R, because we want to evaluate everything inside here uh, with R, as opposed to say you could do a script uh, or a chunk in say Python or SQL or some other type of language like that. So we'll evaluate this one as R code. All of this writing up here is not evaluated, so you could write anything you wanted to. I could write, I like pies, I like seven pies. And it's not gonna mess anything up. It's just gonna add that in as normal text. But then I can interactively work with this document. I can call R code and say, okay, well, the mean was 15.4. The mean was 15.4, um, which is higher than expected. And now I have a comment about um, something I'm working on as opposed to having to generate that um, kind of later on in a separate script or copy paste it. Like we're kind of working our way linearly through a document. You can also uh, create plots. So just as you would expect, uh, you know, you call plot on a data set and it will generate a plot about that data set. But importantly, I've actually added some extra code here inside the parentheses saying echo equals false. So what this means is it tells R Markdown when I, when I save this report and create the output, it won't reflect the code inside. As opposed to up here, it will actually uh, report back saying I called this code. And because I have the output is output HTML document, if I click knit, which creates the output, it will say the code is here because there was nothing here telling it not to echo that code. As opposed to down here on my plot, there isn't any code shown because I said echo equals false. And you can see that was pretty quick in terms of I took just a bunch of text, uh, I had some headers and some, some output, and now I have a, a, a nice report that I could share. And I could open this in, in a browser. I could email this to a colleague and they could open it in their browser. Um, the other kind of half and kind of something I, I breezed over at the beginning was R Markdown has these special headers as opposed to say a basic R uh, script up here has no header. So this R script tells it what's the title and what type of output we want. So I could author it, also add in something like author equals to Thomas Mock, date equals uh, today. So now when I knit it again, or kind of create the output, it adds that in at the top here. So it says author is Thomas Mock and the date is today. I could also put in like a numerical date. Um, you can also change from an HTML document to say a PDF document. And I just change the output to PDF document. And if I knit this again, it has a new output this time because this is actually a PDF output now. So this is an actual PDF file as opposed to HTML content. And uh, as Mike mentioned, you could also do say Word or, or other documents like that. Rather than clicking this button every time, if I wanted to say knit to a different type of output, I could knit to HTML, PDF or Word specifically. 
Um, and I could knit with parameters, which I'll be talking about a little bit later, but that allows you to knit the same report or kind of create the same output by varying some type of input. But the, the basic idea is write code, write text, change your header to, to change the output if you want to do it that way. So we'll jump back into this real quick. Uh, I have some resources here um, for the R Markdown guide, the R Markdown book, and the R Markdown cheat sheet. These are all free resources um, that you can use. They're all online. Um, you can download the cheat sheet and print it out if you wanted to, but the other ones are better sorted to, to leave on the web. The next uh, kind of output I'd like to talk about now that we've covered a little bit of the, the basics of our markdown is presentations. So maybe you're generating a report for a colleague or a different stakeholder in your department. Um, maybe you want to knit to PowerPoint. So again, we can have the same title, but for the output this time in the YAML header, we'll put PowerPoint presentation as opposed to HTML document or PDF document. And this will just generate kind of a basic PowerPoint, but if you had, say, a reference document and you had some stylistic choice you'll had for your, your group, you could have it reference a PowerPoint file that you already had, so it'll add in the right colors, it'll write in the right uh, type of um, like font style or, or however you want to do it. Uh, it can reference that to update the output. I have an example here from the R Markdown book, as well as an example from one of our other websites uh, with specific code to generate kind of a more complex example, but I'll show you a simple one here today. So this quick example, uh, the title is Habits by John Doe. Uh, the date will be way back in 2005, and the output will be a PowerPoint presentation. For PowerPoints, you have these different uh, pound signs you're using, and then you have little um, dashes and some text. So each of these pound signs would indicate a header level. So uh, one pound sign would indicate header one, which means a large text, like something this size, as opposed to a header two would be slightly shrunk down, header three would be even smaller, header four. Each time you add a pound sign there, it basically decreases the size of the text and separates them out like you'd expect. These dashes will then turn into um, bullet points. And then it will indicate a new slide by adding a new pound sign here. So if we look at the output here, the first slide, you can't really see it, but it says habits and John Doe. The next slide says in the morning. And then this uh, slide that we're looking at has getting up. So you can see this header level two gets converted into the header, getting up, and then turn off alarm and get out of bed, turn into bullet points on that page. And this will generate the same thing for other slides where adding a new header will create a new slide. So PowerPoint's great um, in terms of a lot of people still use that, but there's more to life than PowerPoint. In fact, what I'm giving today is actually a presentation, and this presentation was written in R code through an R Markdown document. So both this slide deck and last week's slide deck, or last month's slide deck, were written purely in, in R Markdown. The code for this style of presentation is relatively simple. Thank you to the uh, Zarnigan package by Yi Wei Yi. Uh, and basically, it will take an R Markdown document and convert it into this HTML format with lots of nice add-ins, things like slide numbers and the ability to have you know, iterative processing of a slide. So rather than all of it showing up at once, I can move through a slide uh, in piecewise fashion like this, as well as include images or other things. So the code to generate the previous slide is again, relatively simple. We indicate a new slide by adding three dashes, and then we can add a header with uh, three pound signs. So in this case, rather than separating slides by header level or pound, we just need to add in three dashes. So this will create the title, to add additional little bullet points that pop up throughout, I can actually add two dashes, which means wait, and then generate this on the next click. So wait, then generate this, wait, generate this, wait, generate that. Uh, and then I can add in a picture, and this is actually just a, a image sourced from a URL, so it's actually online, and I set the width equal to 180 pixels. So we go back, each of those different things is accommodated in terms of there's a header, and then I'm iterating across the slide deck um, with those two dashes. 
So technically, again, these slides are HTML5, but we write almost pure R Markdown. And Zeringen does our conversion for us. And this really is, this concept is the power of R Markdown. You basically write R code and knit to whatever is interesting or whatever is useful for your team. And so you're, you might be like, well, okay, well, I can already write in you know, a presentation report. I can just copy paste things back and forth. Um, so why would you want to write slides with code? Well, number one, you can quickly reproduce it. So if, uh, if you wanted to regenerate the code with, uh, or sorry, regenerate the presentation with new inputs, you could just change one thing and generate the whole report again. You can also borrow and edit with code. So if you see someone who created a really cool presentation, you can actually steal little pieces or borrow little pieces of their presentation and add it in. You can also generate tables, plots, words, reports without copy pasting. So taking uh, some type of report you did and rather than copy pasting into PowerPoint or into some other document, you can actually generate it in line here. Additionally, you're able to stay close to the source and the source code. So you're able to, uh, again, rather than copy pasting or not knowing exactly how you got this report generated or this graph generated, you have the exact code for how you reproduced uh, that plot or that table or that output and you're able to share it after the fact. So if we go back to the MT cars data set, which I talked about at the last presentation, um, we'll go through a couple really basic examples. So because our markdown can execute our code, you can generate reports and outputs inside of a presentation. So the MT cars data set has 11 columns and 32 rows. We can also create a table, for example, of this data set via knitter cable. And this will generate a HTML table that works well inside this presentation. So now we have a well-formatted, easily read table uh, very quickly. And again, the code to create the slide that you saw previously is back to empty cars. The empty cars data set has R in call empty cars. So basically because I've added back ticks here and an R, I'm telling R to evaluate only this small chunk right here as valid R code. So it will run the function number of columns on empty cars and report back the 11 columns. And now we can see the 32 rows. So again, back tick R, number of rows in empty cars, rows. And we go back and there's our 32 rows. So I didn't have to copy paste this. This is actually evaluated on the actual data set we're working with. And then lastly, to generate that uh, table, I just called again with back ticks here, R, knitter, cable, the head of empty cars as an HTML table. And it generates this really pretty, uh, easy to use table, which is not a picture. This is actually a, you know, kind of an HTML rich text format. So you're able to still, you know, pull things out of here rather than an image. There's also a couple other packages that can create additional tiles of tables, additional styles of tables uh, that work in either uh, interactive documents like this, or in static documents. So the DT or uh, data table package is a interactive um, framework for interactive tables. So on the same empty cars data set, I can just call a uh, data table on that and it will generate this interactive table now. So now I'm inside of a presentation and I can actually go through and filter or you know, sort these different um, cars according to some variable within the data set. So you know, I can sort by miles per gallon and see that the Cadillac Fleetwood is a big car with eight cylinders, high horsepower, bad gas mileage, as opposed to the Toyota Corolla has good gas mileage, four cylinders, and has a small engine. But I mean, this, this is all on the front end. I don't have to have R at this point to evaluate it. This is an HTML library that's being evaluated only on the server side, or sorry, on the client side. So you could share this with someone and they don't have to know anything about R, but they could still sort through this and kind of play around with the data without having to open R. Also the GT package, I have a guide here as well. Uh, we can click on the link. GT package is another way of creating tables. So this looks very similar to the cable uh, table we created earlier, but GT has a lot of uh, ability to make this table even more attractive or kind of more specific to what you wanna see. So GT does fancier tables too. 
So for this data set, we're looking at some uh, open and closed data from the uh, S&P 500. So we can see we have a date column with a year, month, day format. We've got the open value, the high value, the low value, and the close value of the stock. And then uh, the volume in billions, basically, like 4.4 billion here. So this is like a, a realistic data set you might be working with. But if you wanted to make this into a table, you might want to add a few things. So you want to, might want to make this date a little bit easier to read. You might want to add dollar signs and commas in here for all four of these columns. And maybe instead of writing out, you know, uh, 4,425,830,000, you might just want to write 4.4 billion. That might be more me meaningful. And you can do this with GT. And it will generate it here within your presentation. So taking this code, we use the same data set. We filter only across our uh, six days of interest. So if we go back just these six days, and then we call GT. So we basically make it into a GT table. We can say, okay, we want the tab header, or the table header title to be S&P 500 from start date to end date. And then we can also format the date columns, which are the variables of date to be date style, format currency columns to be dollars, US dollars, and format the last number, which was the 4.4 billion, to be uh, suffixed. So rather than writing out the whole thing, it would do 4.4 B. And it generates this table. So our input table is still nicely formatted for analysis, but now our output table is nicely formatted for viewing. So you could share this with a colleague uh, it's reproducible and you don't have to create a whole new data set. You're just manipulating and changing the data set when it's evaluated. So if we go all the way back, it's still this data set uh, inside R, but this is the output you're getting. And this can become even more powerful if I have like an example report here. So now I'm doing a, a simple report on uh, fuel for the empty cars data set. So I'm still within my presentation. The fuel report, we're saying fuel efficiency is declining with increased displacement. Basically, as the engine size gets larger, the fuel efficiency decreases. The larger engine displacement accounts for 72% of the decline in fuel efficiency, and we have a DT or data table uh, table here, which means I can interact with it and flip through all the different entries, and I can sort by displacement, seeing that, yes, displacement small equals high fuel efficiency. If displacement is larger, the fuel efficiency declines. And then I also have a graph here. So graph of displacement versus miles per gallon and has an R squared of 0 0.72 for a linear model. So again, this is a pretty simple example. It looks okay. I mean, it, it could be better, more, more, uh, more information maybe. But the big thing here is that this was all evaluated with real R code. So I have the exact R code I used to generate that plot. And if I wanted to change something, I could change it at the R code level. So I can fit a linear model of miles per gallon versus displacement, take the summary of that linear model, grab the R squared from the linear model, and then round it to be only two digits. And I'll save that as R squared. I can then put that in line. So the larger engine displacement accounts for R squared multiplied by 100 and add percent at the end. And then call out here to generate my table and then create my ggplot. And in the, in the header here, I'm adding additional R code because that's backticks to say the R squared is here. And this generates this entire slide for myself. So I don't have to do any copy pasting. And if I need to change something, I could change it at the code level to reproduce all of this. And you could you know, take the same concept into PowerPoint or to Word or to PDF. It's just, I'm giving a presentation, so we're putting it into a presentation. That was kind of the end of uh, presentation. So there were some more links there that I put throughout the slides where you can click on different uh, package examples or the different examples of the outputs as well. So book down is another output. So you can actually generate entire books uh, for internal or external consumption in our markdown through the book down package. And the best resource for how to learn book down is at the published book down itself, book down. So if you go here, uh, this is actually a textbook that was created in uh, book down 
and you can go to the website and read the entire book for free at bookdown.org. Uh, so you can see the basic format in terms of it has the chapters and subchapters here on the left. You can filter through it and click on the specific uh, chapter of interest and it will go back and forth between uh, the chapters. And this is all written. You could have code intermingled with, with text. And again, here's that same example, just in a static image. You have uh, the title, you can search through it, you can download the book. Uh, I think you can actually knit it over to PDF if you wanted to, and you have your subchapters here. You might say, okay, well, not all of us are gonna be writing books, but you can write a short book as opposed to, you know, a thousand, line, a thousand pages or something. You could write a five page book. So, but for this example, writing books for external consumption, Examples of many published books at the Bookdown website. I think there's 20 or so free books available here at Bookdown. And you can actually look at the different books that have been published there. Alternatively, you could say, well, what about a book for internal consumption? So if we look at the uh, Tidyverse style guide, this is another Bookdown. It's written mainly for the Tidyverse team when they're writing code, but it also works for other people. So maybe other people want to see this. And they're able to look at, okay, well, naming object names or, or how to space code, uh, different opinions there. So, for example, for your team, you could write a style guide or a, a, some type of guide to how you do something, whether it's an R or something completely separate from R. Um, and you could have, now have a published book for your team that you can just throw up on a web page or distribute. An alternative example would be the BBC uh, news organization's R Graphic Cookbook. So this is a book, but it was actually created with the Cosmo theme of our markdown. It's not a book down book. Uh, this just has a table of contents floating on the left in a similar way. And they actually have all the R code to generate it here on GitHub. But just so you know what I'm talking about, here is a book down where you have, you know, the ability to filter and you have all the columns and uh, chapters here. This is another style of book you could write that's more uh, kind of interactive in a way you just filter through it and slide down and it will have this floating table of contents that tells you where you are in the presentation. So this BBC guide uh, has some of the uh, ggplot examples I showed from our last presentation um, in terms of generating bar plots or mixed bar plots or uh, grouped bar plots and it has all the example code and some descriptions about how to create these plots yourself. So this is actually a really good resource as well. Um, yeah, so, and then that's kind of it for, for books as opposed to web pages. So, and there's kind of a mix there because you think that uh, uh, those books were all hosted on as web pages, but a book for consumption versus a web page for consumption. Distill is another format for creating websites. It could also be for technical blog or for sharing information. Um, I use it personally for, for my blog, and we actually have an RStudio environment website uh, that actually uses this to, to talk about um, package management for, for your team. You can see this is a full-blown website. It's, you can search it on Google. It's actually published. It has multiple pages about how you go through and can click through and examine the different web pages, as opposed to a, a, a blog like my personal blog here. Uh, this is hosted for free through Netlify, but I can click on uh, different examples that has my blog post, and then um, I've got text here where I write some text, I have a table in here, some library examples, and this is my blog, and I'm, I'm just hosting it. Example here of a distill. And we'll stop real quick there for a second. So we've generated some uh, inline reports for a presentation. We've generated web pages. We've generated maybe some books, whether they were for internal, external consumption. Now we talk about reports. And I feel like reports is a very strong part of our markdown. But whenever people start talking about reports, they think of, in my mind, slow, tedious, and time consuming, kind of like this, this turtle here who's just taking up the page and it's not moving very quickly. So the pain point for reports is they're manual, they're tedious, they're slow. And the solution here is parameters in R Markdown. So in this case, you can generate the same report but with new data. So let's say you have a report you have to send out every month or every week or every day, and the format is basically the same, 
you can write it all the code one time, so all the code is identical, but you change the input. So the end result is according to the new input data. I'll give you an example about how this works. So the situation is maybe I'm an FAA data analyst. My boss asked me for a report on how many animals were hit by planes in Texas last year. My goal, create a report for Texas in 2018. Result, I go and get the data, I create a graph, I paste it into a document and I send it to my boss. I'm feeling good, I'm done for the day. My boss emails me later that day, 4.55 p.m. saying, I need a report for 2015, 2016, 2017 ASAP. You can't go home until it's done. I'm unhappy, I have to do this whole thing all over again. So now I have to go create three new reports. I go back and get the data again, create three graphs, paste into three new docs and send along. I miss dinner, I don't get home until seven o'clock. Alternatively, I could have written a parameterized our markdown report. I wrote the code one time and I execute the code n number of times. So I save myself a massive amount of time in the long run. And I'll show you what this looks like in terms of if we were to knit a report like this. So if we go here to our uh, animal report, I could actually just, we'll just ignore it for a second and I'll knit the report. Just as we were doing before, I just clicked the knit button. And now I have a total impact report. So this is state of Texas, years 2018. This is what my boss asked me for first. So we can see that for the biggest airlines, Southwest, American, United, and Delta, they hit somewhere in the range of 170 to 35 animals in 2018. So I have this report I sent to my boss. But then he's asking me about the, um, the other year, so maybe instead of 2018, I need to do 2015. So now in my YAML header, if you, if you saw that before I showed you, I've added a new thing here, params, which means parameters. Basically, I'm telling our markdown to store this for me. I'm storing uh, a parameter of years and a parameter of state. So for the first label, I'll have year, the value bill 2018, and I'm adding some additional code here saying I want to have it be interactive. So the minimum year would be 1990 all the way up to 2018. And it will iterate across that by one with no separator. Alternatively for states, the value will default to Texas, but I can select any of the states that I want. So all 50 states are here. If I go here and instead of just clicking on the center and clicking knit, I can do knit with parameters. I click knit with parameters, it actually opens up this new page. I can say, okay, well, I want the report for 2015 in Texas, and I knit that report. While that's actually being generated, I could generate a new report if I wanted to, but I'll wait for it to actually generate. And now we have the report for 2015. I can go back and I can knit it again, and I'll say, what about uh, 1999? And I knit the report. And it's generating this new report with 1990, uh, 1999. We can see American Airlines still on top for number of animals uh, struck. But really what I'm trying to hit here is that I wrote this code one time. And yes, th there's a decent chunk of code here. There's about 70 lines of code to generate what state am I looking at, what year am I looking at, filtering, arranging, and grouping the data set, and then creating a plot. But I only had to write that one time and I'm able to generate basically 50 different states across 28 years, you know, somewhere in the range of, uh, I think it's a thousand reports. So I could generate a thousand reports just from this one, you know, set of code. And that's really the power of parameterization as opposed to copy and pasting. Alternatively, rather than, you know, manually clicking around, which is totally fine, I can also generate the ports programmatically. So rather than having to click knit or change a parameter, like if I wanted uh, this to be 2017, I would have to change it here or knit it with parameters and actually uh, go through the whole process of clicking around. But if I needed to do this a hundred times, that's a lot of clicking still. So I'm saving some time, but I could save even more time. So here for the example, I have our markdown package and we're calling render. And we're calling it on the specific uh, report that I was working with, which is param report programmatic dot rmd. So we're telling this function, I want to use this specific report, and the parameters I want to use are states equal to Texas and year equal to 2018. And this will generate the same report that we saw previously. 
state equals Texas, year equals 2018, and here's our graph. So I could use this code and just change, uh, you know, copy paste this into R and run that and just change Texas in 2018 rather than having to do a bunch of clicks. But again, that still doesn't save us as much time as if we wrote a full function to, to build it out. But let's take a quick example. Actually, sorry, go back one. So just to prove that this does work, we'll take that code put it into R and call that code, and we can see that it generates the report. And the report will be here. It generated a new one, param report programmatic, and we can view it in the web browser. And there's our Texas 2018. Let's delete that report. Cool. Go back. So let's say that we had um, a bunch of different reports we wanted to generate. To make this process easier down the road, I'm gonna write my own custom function, which says, you know, I wanna render a report. This is the report I wanna start with. So render this report. The parameters are still gonna be a list of uh, states equal to states, years equal to years, but I wanna customize the output file. And I'm using the, the glue function again, which will paste in states and years here because they have parentheses on the exterior. And this allows me to generate a report where every report is not named the same. It'll basically say Texas 2018 or 2015 here. So if I call my function render impact report, states equal to Texas, render and years equal to 2015, it will output that with 2015 in Texas as the um, name here. And just as a quick example of what that looks like, we need to tell the render function which file to use. So parameter report programmatic RMD, as we see here, what parameters via params, so params equals to a list of states equal to states, years equal to years, and our output file, which we're using glue function to generate meaningful file names. And again, glue pastes in variables that are surrounded by parentheses. So if we took states equal to Texas and years equal to 2018 and said we wanna glue this together, it will add in Texas here and 2018 here because they're surrounded in our parentheses brackets. And this is the output. We can see it says animal impact Texas dash 2018, which is what we would expect from the function above. So that's great. I mean, we have this custom function, but that still doesn't solve the problem of having to generate many reports. So if we combine our reporting function, with per, then we can generate these reports programmatically and in bulk. So let's just say we have a new glue function. This glue function says, take states and years and output the state is state and the year is years. So if we say output state year equal to Texas in 2019, the state is Texas and year is 2019. Okay. So that, that probably makes sense at this, stamp, at this point in terms of that's what we're just pasting in here. But what if we want to do this in number of times? So we want to do this across multiple states and multiple years. So for states, we'll do repeat Texas three times and years will be 2016 to 2018. So 2016, 2017, 2018. And this Texas will be repeated three times. I can use the per PMAP function where my inputs now are states and years. And I'm basically saying dot L, which is all my inputs, is a list of state and years. And the function I'm calling is dot F equal to output state year. So our function is output state year like we were calling before. It will iterate across each of these combinations. So Texas 2016, Texas 2017, Texas 2018, and generate the output, which is exactly what we get. State is Texas, year is 2016. State is Texas, year is 2017. Texas, 2018. So this is a basic example, and we're gonna build upon this for the multiple report function we have from before. So back to our custom render function. We're gonna render an impact report, which takes this specific R markdown document with these parameters, states and years, and we want the output file to be a meaningful report name that has states and years in the title. We're gonna iterate across each combination of state and year, and each combo will generate a report with a custom file name based on the input, because we have this output name here. 
And this process scales from one report to hundreds of reports. So I could still use this function for one-off reports, or if someone said, I need all the reports for all 50 states across the past 28 years, I can generate that report while I go to lunch, and it will go across and do all 1,000 combinations. So if we're building out these many reports, we need to specify what states and what years of interest. And this could scale to, to whatever kind of parameters you want, but I'm using the same report. So again, re repeat Texas equal to four, and we're gonna use 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018. So states equals to four, four times Texas, years equals 2015 to 2018. And then we'll apply the function to each element of the vector. So we we'll, can use per to apply the function across the years. So it'll say Texas 2015 for report one, Texas 2016, Texas 2017, Texas 2018 because we're passing states and years as our input variables. And our output function is the render impact report. So I'll go to, we'll go move over to the live demo of that so you can actually believe me because that's a lot of me talking. So let's just say we want to render a report. So if we go into an R Markdown document, I have a live demo one here. The goal of this report function is to make the generating the reports as easy as pi, and I like pi. This function creates a report with a nice name, and we need to make sure to put it inside of a code chunk. So here's our render impact report. The same thing we've been working with. It's got the R markdown we're putting in and the parameters of states and years. And our output file, which is animal impact input state dash input year, and then HTML is the output. We go back to glue and we can load that library. We can assign Texas in 2018 as their values for the respective variables. So state equals Texas, years equals 2018. And I can call glue on that and we can see it generates the report animal impact Texas 2018 because these are shrouded in parentheses. Now, if we go into per, when we do assignment, we want to create more than one value per variable. So rather than saying one Texas, we want three times Texas. And for years, we want 2016 through 2018. So we'll assign those. They've been updated here. So you can see states equal to Texas three and years are 2016 to 2018. And we can call our per map function, which is pmap, which basically integrates across all of our variables and has one output function. And I didn't save that, ah, I didn't call this function up here. So if we call our, our variable, so glue is state, Texas in 2019, the state is Texas, and here is 2019. So we'll reload those, so Texas is three, 2016 to 2018, and now when we call this function, it outputs the state is Texas in years 2016, Texas 2017, Texas 2018. Now, if we apply this to our report function, you can see over here, I only, I don't have any reports out generated. Well, I actually have one, the basic uh, RMD output, but we can see that's not what we're looking for. That's the old report. So I need to generate all of my reports fresh. So I'll assign this four times. So Texas is four now, uh, one, two, three, four Texases, and years is 2015 to 2018. I can generate the reports here by calling pmap again. So the same idea, states and years is our input, and we want the render impact report as our function to call. And I didn't save my render impact report. So we will go back here. And now, thank goodness I have copy pasting available for this one example. So I never saved my function. So the function had to be saved in here. So if I create my render impact report and I call it, it will now start processing. So it's going 20 to 100%, 20 to 100%. It's basically going through each iteration of the combinations. If we go down here, we now have reports from 2015, 2016, 2017, and 2018. And just so that we believe that they're actual reports, this is 2015. Let's try 2017, and this is 2017. So it, it created the reports as we would expect it. It just iterated across Texas in the years and created all those reports from scratch. I'm not gonna create a thousand reports because that will take a while, 
But that's the concept that we could do is generate many reports all at once. Altogether, we need to write the function, specify the parameter inputs, so multiple inputs basically, and then uh, knit slash render the four reports. So tell it what inputs, and then use our function uh, as the output. Last thing I'd like to cover, uh, so that's pretty quick, but I do have the examples and I'll actually be sharing this whole workspace with you so you can actually play around with it yourself as well. Um, and we'll move on to dashboards. So for dashboards, you probably think of something like this where you have graphs, you have some you know, column separations and you can play around with them. We can do this in R through Flex Dashboard. So I like to say if you can create a ggplot, you can create a Flex Dashboard. Like in reality, it's almost that simple. So this idea of here of having you know, four graphs on a page with some nice uh, surrounding to make a dashboard style, this is really just four different ggplots and we're just separating them by some special R markdown code. You can also go to the Flex Dashboard site after the fact to look at the, the different formats. So the first example is in our YAML header, we need to put title equals whatever you want the title to be, and the output will be Flex Dashboard, Flex Dashboard. This space is saying you're creating a Flex Dashboard as opposed to an HTML document or a PDF document. It defaults to column-based, where this column, uh, you would say like column, or this would be the title, uh, and you need to separate it by many dashes. Um, this is like 12 or 20 dashes, but I think you just need to have five. So as long as you had more than five dashes, it will actually create a separation. This will be your first chart, and you could put in ggplot code here or whatever you wanted. And this will say, let's put in a new column with two charts in it. So we're expecting one chart on the left, two charts on the right. And this is the output we get in terms of one long chart on the left and then a new column, chart two, chart three stacked on top of each other. The alternative format, which would be the same thing, flex dashboard, flex dashboard is the output. But now we're doing orientation of, as rows. So we're doing row one on top of row two. And row one has one chart, row two has two charts in it. So we'd expect one long, or sorry, one wide and then two uh, narrow charts, and that's what we get. So because we have the row separation here, it would separate these out. If you didn't have a new row here, like if this part was missing, sorry, just this part and the lines below it, it would make all three charts right next to each other, left to right. And we'll go into a live demo real quick of what that looks like. So for basic flex dashboard, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time um, going through the code again, because this is the same type of report we are generating, just I'm separating this out into three different panes. So this will be a column-based layout. So you can see I have column and I have my separations. I'm also indicating I want this one to be really wide. So it's gonna be 650. Uh, as opposed to this one, this column will be 350. The whole thing adds up to a thousand. So this will be basically two thirds and one third is what it ends up being. I'll create one big graph, and then I'll create two graphs on the right side, impacts for Southwest, impacts for American Airlines. So let's generate this report. We'll knit it out, it will create it, and now I have a new report I can open in my browser, and I have a giant uh, graph for total impacts by airline, and then these kind of trends of what we're seeing for Southwest and American Airlines. And we expect this because one column on the left, two. Uh, one column on the right, but, but two separate graphs because we have this separation in terms of this is the first column with one graph. Insert a new column. Here's graph one. Here's graph two. And these headers here will indicate new graph or, or new, new text. I could also write, you know, this is a trend for American Airlines. And if I re-knit that, it will add in that text because it's outside of the code chunk and it will evaluate it just as text as opposed to, to code. So this is a trend for American Airlines here, as you can see. And again, this is a, a web-based format, so you could email it back and forth or share it, and you could open it in a browser and they could look at it. It also, um, interestingly, it will resize itself because it's written in HTML uh, according to how big they make it. So it actually scales around as you change the, the size. So it also scaled to mobile. All right, 
we'll go back. And really, that's kind of in the presentation. We're, we're close to time. I actually got it 10 minutes this time as opposed to five minutes as last time. These are all the resources for the different things we created today. Our markdown, parameterization, Zeringen, PowerPoint presentations, Flex dashboards, books, uh, web pages, and HTML documents, as well as the entire R Markdown book, which was written in uh, Bookdown. And this is basically every example of R Markdown you can think of. It, it's thousands of pages. It's an amazing resource. Um, and then the other thing I'm sharing with your team is this R Studio Cloud link. So if you actually click on this, it will take you to this entire report and all the slides I built for you. Um, so you can actually instantly try out this code and play around with it and, and try out R in our studio without having to download or install anything. So hopefully that will be helpful for your team. And th that's the end of the presentation for today. So I'll unmute again and appreciate